I am really, really, really excited to be joined by the nun or the one and only, I guess, Suzanne Bernier. And instead of me going into a long diatribe about all of her experiences and, and everything that she's been working on, I'll throw it over to Suzanne to talk a little bit about what her background is, what she's bringing to the table, and then we'll, we'll start talking about crisis leadership. So Suzanne, thank you very, very much for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to chat. Thanks very much for having me, Daryl. And uh, I'd be, I'm very happy to be able to share some of my experiences um, with those who this might be able to, to help, this conversation might be able to help them um, as they lead um, their organization through this or whatever crisis it may be in the future. I've been in emergency management now for over 23 years and uh, started off as a, actually as a spokesperson for our Emergency Management Ontario, which was called Emergency Measures Ontario back in the day. Uh, and then realized, wait a minute, there are people that actually respond to emergencies. And uh, I don't wanna just talk about these people. I wanna be one of these people. So I went to the director at the time and basically said that and ended up going to the only school in Canada where you could get school in emergency management at the time, which was run, run by the feds, the um, Canadian Emergency Preparedness College. Uh, so I ended up in there taking all of the intensive courses that they had with, it was kind of me and a bunch of uh, retired fire chiefs and police officers that would get appointed with that duty at the time. Here, you're gonna be the community emergency management person. Uh, so I got some great mentorship from amazing people who were leading crisis response for their own communities all across Canada, who are now you know, in this training facility where we all had to live and, and, and be together for a week at a time, uh, depending on the course. So once I came out of there, there happened to be an availability for an officer position at EMO, and I interviewed and, and, and got it, and I became the first female uniformed field officer in Ontario from it, now that I look back. Um, and uh, so then did that for about five years, uh, going around my task was apart from, and there were only four of us officers at the time, um, now there are several more, and a lot more got hired after the ice storm of 1998, which was my first deployment as a field officer, was the ice storm of the century. Um, so I got the job as an officer, and then a few months later, the ice storm of the century happened, and that was my first deployment. But as you know, the best way to learn is to be plunked in the middle of something like that, right? So I was able to learn so much from what is still the largest coordinated effort in response to a disaster in Canada. Um, with the military and, and all sorts of levels of government and communities involved in that response for five weeks, some areas did not have power. So did that. Uh, and then when there were not emergencies that I would get sent to, to work out of emergency operations centers with the leaders from various communities, whether it's in Ottawa or in a First Nations community, in Piawanek or anywhere in between, um, I had the opportunity to be able to be in the emergency operations centers, working with those leaders to be able to help them and assist them. Um, and when there weren't emergencies going on, my role was I had about 44 communities in my area where I, I was tasked with helping them develop their emergency response plans, their communications plans, um, their training on how to respond to any disaster or crisis um, and setting up their emergency operations centers the right way and all, all of those kinds of things. So it was a lot of great work with a lot of communities who really, really took it seriously and wanted to be able to make sure that they could respond to anything that they could. I then went to work for the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and my responsibility there was to go to the different nuclear facilities and help run exercises and evaluate how efficient and effective their nuclear plans were. I then went, came back to the province and developed our first business continuity plans for our provincial government when the term BCP or business continuity was first came, first came out. Then went to I had a lot of different responsibilities. Then went to Toronto Hydro, which is our first our, our major power provider in Toronto, and created their emergency management and business continuity program. In the mean before that, worked for our workplace safety and insurance board, developed the first pandemic plan in Ontario, uh, and from that presented in Davos, Switzerland on it, ended up finding out 
that it was pretty much the best pandemic plan of its time out there, and then was asked to go to the United Nations headquarters for two months to develop their first pandemic tabletop exercise on how, to, how effective their plans were if this exact scenario in New York, unfortunately, is unfolding now, how they would be able to handle this exact scenario. If a pandemic situation happened and hit specifically New York City, where how the United Nations would be able to still function and perform their roles in a global capacity. And I can tell you, I'm sure that they've been pulling out those plans um, for several weeks now to be able to respond to this. Well, let's hope they've been pulling right. out those plans because uh, both of us know that many a fantastic plan has stayed on the shelf and then it's afterwards, hey, right. we should have had a plan for this. And it's yeah. like, uh, we did. And so then after that experience, how did, uh, wh where'd you go from there? So after that, I, yeah, so then I was at, I was at Workplace Safety and Insurance Board when I presented on the pandemic plan, right, that we created, then took a leave of absence to be able to go the, to the UN headquarters and came back to WSIB. Um, and then I was asked by Toronto Hydro to then head up their emergency management and business continuity program. And then that was my uh, last real job, I guess, because in the meantime, as I was doing all of this work, I was also volunteering. That's how I chose to spend my time um, and my, um, my resources was to be able to go to New Orleans and help volunteer after Katrina several times on a regular basis, as well as being able to go to New York after Hurricane Sandy. And that allowed me to get a lot better perspective on what's happening on the ground in these disasters that I normally would not have the, have the chance to be deployed to as a, an emergency management officer or you know, the head of Toronto Hydro, I wouldn't be tasked with going um, to those areas. So I wanted to be able to get a really good insight. And the best way you can get an insight is to be able to be right there on the ground when it's happening. And if it takes you being volunteering to do that, well, then that, that's what I was able to do. Then, um, so I would, I'd be going back and forth and while I was with Toronto Hydro as well. And then I realized about two and a half years in um, to that role that I really needed to focus on what I had seen behind the scenes in New Orleans specifically about the heroic stories and how the empowering positive side of disasters and how ordinary people step up. And now more than ever, we need that public private partnerships concept even more so um, and, and so I wanted to promote that and I wanted to write a book. And so I resigned from my full-time job to, because I had this passion and commitment that I wanted to get positive messaging out to people. And I wanted to share what really goes on behind the scenes and all of everybody coming together, um, to be able to get people through a disaster. And so I did that. I wrote a book, um, spent a couple of years kind of looking for these everyday heroes from these major disasters that everybody would have heard about from 9-11 uh, onwards, and then released that. It ended up being, it was just really a passion project for me, and I wanted to be able to get these stories out if it could inspire one person to know how you could step up potentially, and you don't need a badge to be a hero basically was the bottom line and the message, even though all of our badge wearers and our first responders and our healthcare professionals, of course, are our heroes. But um, there's a way that all of us can potentially offer our heroic talents during an emergency. So that's kind of what I focused on in the book. And then it kind of became pretty, pretty popular in our industry, which I, I wasn't even really thinking about that. And I got to speak at the White House uh, in 2016 because of it, where Somebody from FEMA happened to be in the audience when I was talking about disaster heroes. And then FEMA had a, a big award ceremony in recognition of people and communities who were doing proactive things to be able to help in innovative ways before disasters hit. And so they have a, a ceremony every year. And then in 2016, they asked if I would be the keynote speaker. And then I gave out copies of my book to all of the award winners who were amazing people from all over America. And since then, you know, um, it's been, a, it's been a, a ride, uh, ever Just since. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I've been consulting, I've been speaking a lot, uh, at different conferences around the world based on my experiences, um, with so many different types of industries and, uh, and disasters. 
And so I, there's so much to unpack. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time in the day. Because uh, very much like you, I followed a similar path where I was volunteering in search and rescue. And this is now over 30 years for me. And I left my full-time corporate job in 2006 to make a difference and all those other things. And, and people typically ask me, or they often ask me, they ask me two questions. What's the worst thing you've ever seen? And of course, I'm not going to go into a, you know, the graphic detail of, of those types of things. But then they ask like, Daryl, why, why do you do it? You see the worst, you see all the death and the destruction and you're surrounded by it. But I choose to see them as amazing, amazing opportunities for people to come together. And, and unless you are on the front lines, you don't see that. And I have this inherent belief that humans are good. We are good people. We are hardwired to help. And one of the challenges, I think, with this particular event, as we record it, it's COVID. And I think this will be indicative of the future. Social media is really good at focusing on the negative. The, the, the handful, just like with Katrina and any of these other disasters, everyone always focuses on looting. You know, looting is happening all over. And it's almost like, oh my gosh, I can't even step out of the emergency operations center. It sounds like I'm going to get mugged, but that is, as you know, statistically a very small percentage of, of what right. goes on relative to how about the millions of people that are in this case, self-isolating, they're being responsible. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're dropping off food to their parents on the doorstep, like they're supposed to all of those things. And so every time I deploy much like you, I actually feel really good. Yeah. And I leave just thinking people are good, you know? And, and so- listen- I agree completely with your statement and so much so that that really was why I was inspired to write the book in the first place was because I had been hearing in the media reports and I used to be a media person. I used to be a journalist before I got into emergency management. That's a whole other story. But when I was seeing the coverage on television of the looting and all of these horrific stories of what was happening supposedly on the ground in New Orleans. And then when I would get there and I saw all of the incredible things that were happening behind the scenes of everything from everyday people who already lost their homes themselves to other community members to you know famous people from around the world who were all coming together to help rebuild and you weren't seeing the coverage on that and i thought okay well that's why i have to write this book because if the media aren't going to focus on the positive and all of the goodness that comes together that most of the time, fortunately, the general public don't see. But people need to be aware of not just the negative portrayal, but be aware of all of the goodness and all of the heroes that are around us every time there's an emergency, like you said. And it's an important point. And then we'll dive into a few other more specific topics. But it's also important to recognize, you alluded to it, where you don't need a badge. You don't need a title. You don't need to be branded the leader or to do something. Do the right thing. And if it feels good, if it feels right, do it. Make it happen. And don't expect somebody else to tell you that you need to. Because as human beings, we know what's right. We know what's wrong. And in this case, we need to act on it. Because the society constructs that we typically have may not be in place. So it requires us to take personal responsibility. And you know, would I love the government to be... Uh, taking care of my mom and dad, and my mom's got dementia, would I love that? Of course I would, but they're not, and that's okay. That's up to my brother and I to now take it upon ourselves and, and do the right thing. And so to me, kind of mirror your, your experience, I know because we deployed to Katrina, for example, just north of Gulfport, and one of the most organized uh, responses was actually not even the fire departments. It was actually a school where we were working out of, you know, the principal was the, as we would call it, the incident commander, and they had it dialed in. And to be honest, uh, you know, full transparency, when we were asked to go work with them, I was like, oh, great. You know, like, okay, where are we going to start? Okay, we, you know, let's start really simple with them because they're not used to this. We walked in and Suzanne, they had maps, they had, you know, the, just the teachers were deploying, the teachers were organizing. So I thought, oh, shoot, I got to say something. So I said, well, you guys could have a check-in table right here. I'm like, and that was my contribution <laughs> after 30 years of response. I'm like, huh, I got to say something. So yeah, you guys should have a registration right here by the door. That's right. That is what I'm bringing to the table. (laughs) So it really stuck out with me that 
as, as responders, I think we often get arrogant about what we know and what other people don't know. But anyways, that's a whole different conversation. So I'm, I'm very curious. You have seen such a tremendous range of leadership and, and leading during crisis and not. And I want to start with one of the areas I, I really like to hone in on is inner mastery. And as I've defined it is the ability to control the inside first, because as we talk about off camera, if you can't control that, you have zero chance of communicating effectively and managing other people and making decisions and all of those other things. So what kind of emotions and thoughts have you had when you've gone into situations or what have you seen others experience right. from your huge breadth of experience? Well, I think that our leaders in these incident command centers or emergency operations centers, sometimes we, we don't, we're not aware of, or they're not aware of their capabilities or their limitations until they're thrown into a situation. And we're witnessing that in, in a variety of different cities and areas now where, unfortunately, some people perhaps are not the right people to be, to, to be leading. And it's no fault of their own. And mm -hmm. they, may, they may very well have thought that they, were, they could handle it. Uh, and maybe just for whatever reasons that they have personally or psychologically um, or, or potentially affected by the crisis at hand, um, sometimes we have to be aware of perhaps they're not the right people to be leading at the time, depending. And we have to be okay with it if we're the leader um, that is facing that and, and admit it. And it doesn't mean that we're not an effective leader at the best of time, but perhaps not for the given situation that you're in. And I've seen that happen several times before where you might have people who don't play nice, and I'm sure you've seen that a lot, right? Where that's the most important thing in, in any type of leadership situation during a crisis is the ability to be able to play as a team member as opposed to just thinking of yourself as the commander and the leader. And I think that term right there is, is kind of, it's a, it's not a, it's, it's a bad term where somebody might think, okay, I'm the commander. So you listen to me. Whereas really what you're supposed to be is a collaborator and a, a team member of everybody who has to come together. And I think that's one of the most important lessons that we learn sometimes is that people are not willing to admit that perhaps they are not the right person to be leading and they don't even realize it until they're thrown into the middle of the crisis. So that there's, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because to me, two words that come to mind that I have personally been really uh, working on and identifying two words that we didn't hear 10 years ago around leadership. One is vulnerability and two is empathy. And yeah. to your point, 10 years ago, Suzanne, you come to me and to be honest and full transparency, you're not even from this world and you're female and, 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 and. And so there was no even recognition of any other expertise or any other emotional intelligence required around leadership. And that was the model that I was brought up in and you absolutely the same way. And I think to your point, fortunately, we've seen the need to flip this around and the leader is here and the team is here. And so can you talk about what empathy means to you or how a leader could demonstrate empathy? Because during sure. crisis in particular, empathy, I think, should be a superpower and it's really difficult to, yeah. for people to, to reach. So in your experience, what does empathy look like to you from a, a crisis leadership perspective? That's a great question. Empathy to me is, first of all, being able to show honesty and openness, being open and honest and not afraid to show your vulnerabilities, as you were saying, because we are all at the bottom line is whether you're the president or you're, uh, you know, a homeless person or whatever level you are, we are all just humans. We are all people. We all have feelings and reactions. And yes, it's important as a leader, as you're guiding people through a crisis or an event, it's important to have that stable appearance and be calm and be able to deliver a message, but you also need to be human and be able to be communicating to people as if they're your friend. Because we all have friends, we all have real lives. We're not all just these faces that are directing people on what to do and it's okay. And people will connect with you more if they can feel that they can one, actually trust you 
and that you're feeling the same, they're feeling the same thing that you're feeling, but that they're not panicking about it and they're not yelling things out and they're not, you know, ordering things, but they can deliver the messaging in a calm, soothing tone, but also projecting that they care. However, there are some leaders that we witnessed and I've witnessed before that I would say have to be removed from those positions because some people just, not, not most of us, but some of us do not have that empathy within us. And we've seen leaders, and I'm not going to mention who they are, but of businesses, let's say large companies, who have made some pretty poor decisions or delivered some messaging, and not because they did it on purpose, but that's just who they are. And some people just don't have that within them. Well, I would suggest that the people who don't have that within them, whether they're the CEO of a company or the, the communication spokesperson, you need to have a face that is going to be someone who does have that compassion is not just faking it mm -hmm. because that's going to come through too. As a yeah. crisis communications person, I'm, you know, that's the first thing is openness and honesty and people can tell if you're faking it or not. So we really have to take a good look at looking at who our leaders are and then making sure that they're the right fit and perhaps they're not the most compassionate. Well, maybe those aren't the people that should be leading the decisions when we need compassionate people and to be specifically delivering the message to a general audience. And I think you've hit on a number of very important points. And that is really during crisis, we all have to recognize this is the human experience. We're all going through this together. And it doesn't matter if you're making $2 million or $2,000. Your community is now different. Maybe you're used to going to church. Maybe you're used to reaching out to friends. Maybe your outlets are going out for beer only one or two, of course, in healthy moderation. <laughs> but uh, all of those other things, and I think as leaders, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts, as leaders, going back to our discussion a little earlier, our paradigm or, you know, of, of the model is that strong, fearless leader. But I'm of the opinion that there's no such thing as fearlessness. We all, we all experience fear. It's natural, but it's acting in spite of that fear. But leaders get stuck on this. I'm the leader. I can't show weakness. I'm certainly not going to ask anybody for their opinion because that would indicate that I don't know what I'm doing. So are those things, you know, what I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Is, are those experiences that you've seen? Definitely. And I think that because of our industry, right? And you said it before, it's, it's been and it still remains a very male dominated industry where a lot of, and I, I don't mean to say this as, as a woman, just as a person in the field for so long, having observed that I believe that a lot of men um, are raised to and, and believe in society that they have to portray this strong, you know, I've got it all under control. And, and yeah, and, and that's why they're leaders is because they've been chosen because of that. However, they also must be honest with and open about that they don't, none of us know everything, regardless of what you lead and what, you know, what background you have. And if you're male or female, none of us know everything. And the more that we can be together to be able to put all of our minds together and combine all of the skills and knowledge that we have, that's what makes a true leader is mm -hmm. to be able to acknowledge that they don't know everything and to be able to make sure that they get the right people who do know all of the different things that they are not the expert in into their team and listen to them. That's what makes an efficient leader. And we've seen some great leaders do that. And I've seen some great leaders behind the scenes in communities and emergency operations centers. And those are the ones that come out so much better after an emergency are the communities that have been led by someone who admits and knows that they don't know everything, but that they know some great people who do, and they're going to combine them all together to guide this leader to then make the right informed decisions based on all of the experts' knowledge. And really important, couple of important points out of that. First of all, as a male, and we're not going to make this a male versus female, but I, I can say this isn't Suzanne just defending her gender, folks. I see it all the time and I'm guilty of it myself. So full transparency. And also to, you know, during crisis, and we could replace the word community with corporation, whether it be small, large or whatever. So anytime that we use the word community, 
it's your organization. Maybe it's your nonprofit as well. So one thing that I've recognized, and, and you talked about it, is during crisis, all of those conventional silos and those reporting structures and all of that expertise that exists within the organization, normally it's pushed down pretty low. But I think you talked about it, and we'll lead into a conversation about how we make decisions during crisis. But during crisis is now the time for that leader to reach into the organization remove the three or four levels of bureaucracy and reporting structure and get them into the room so that you can start getting your situation awareness, as we would call it, you gather information to start making the, these decisions. What, what are your thoughts on that around taking this frontline worker? Are you kidding me, Suzanne? I, they never go to the 30th floor, but grabbing them and bringing them up. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think we need to be more we need to acknowledge more of that within our organizations and in our businesses about identifying who the experts are in different areas and being able to access them and develop a relationship with them hopefully before a crisis happens so that when you're, you need to call upon them or you might not even need to call upon them, if you've already got a relationship established with these people, that you can turn to, they'll come to you and offer their assistance and advice, maybe even before the crisis hits the fan, you know, where they might come to you and tell you, hey, listen, I, you know, I'm aware of this. If you've already got that relationship, that's what also really makes a good leader is for people being able to feel like you're open enough that they can come to you to be able to potentially share some of the knowledge that they're seeing that may prevent you from having to lead through a crisis if you've already mm -hmm. established and you've acknowledged who those experts are. I think that a lot of leaders as well perhaps might feel that internally for them to do that might seem like, oh, they, like you said, they don't have it under control and they're the leader. So why do they need to go, you know, all these levels down, but they should know everything. But realistically, mm -hmm. we all know that's not the case. And we just need to get real and honest um, as leaders, wherever we are, that nobody knows everything. And you know, every community, every company that's gone through a crisis, there's not one person that has saved the day and led them through that crisis. Nowhere. You, can name, you can't name one where there's one person. You hear some people talk about how it's them who saved the day and nobody else. But realistically, we know better that there's never, never been a crisis in any company or community where one person or one organization even is the only one that has saved the day.